Good afternoon and welcome to the Subcommittee on Planning Dispositions and Concessions. This is where we vote and hear projects for affordable housing that are using city land. Councilmember Ben Kalos, Chair of this Committee, you can always tweet me at Ben Kalos with any questions you might have. We are joined today by Councilmember Ruben Diaz Sr., who is always early, always on time, and one of the reasons we're able to do so much in this committee. Thank you, sir. Today we'll be holding a hearing on one project in Councilmember Salmanca's District 599 Cortland Avenue. Land use item 232, Park and Elton, is being laid over. If you are here to testify, please fill out a white speaker slip with the sergeant at arms and indicate the land use number of the item you wish to testify on that slip. Before we begin our hearing, we'll vote to approve four projects with several applications. Hunters Point South, Sunset Park 1 through 4, Hobson's Hopkinson Park Place on 21 Arden Street, which were the subjects of hearings on October 3rd. Land use item 221, Hunters Point South is related to a property at 52-03 Center Boulevard known as Parcel C, the North Tower, in the Long Island City neighborhood of Queens in Councilmember Van Bramer's district. HPD seeks approval of a new Article 11 tax exemption for a period of 40 years. This is pursuant to Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law. The project, which would provide rental housing for low-income fam families, received UDAP approval in 2008. It will consist of one residential building totaling 855,541 square feet with 8,071 square feet of commercial space. Land use item 222 is an application to modify the UDAP approval previously granted in 2008 to reflect the addition of two new 80,000 square foot SCA schools to the overall Hunters Point South plan. Pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law, HPD seeks UDAP designations for properties located at 2nd Street, 54-02 2nd Street and 52-52 2nd Street in the Long Island City neighborhood of Queens in order to accommodate the inclusion of the new schools to the project and lower the, uh, the area median incomes for residents. Under the proposed project, the city will still sell the disposition areas for the construction of approximately 16 buildings containing a total of approximately 4,076 units. That's more than some towns and villages in the state of New York. However, under this approval, apparent, approximately 2,446 units will be rented or sold to households with incomes ranging from as low as 30% of AMI to 165% of AMI, and approximately 1,630 units will be rented or sold at market rate prices. Sponsors will also construct approximately 109,824 square feet of retail space, approximately 45,000 square feet of community facility space and accessory parking on the disposition area and develop portions of the disposition area as public and private open spaces. Councilmember Van Bramer is in support of these applications. Land use items 226, 227, 228 and 229 are Sunset Parks 1 through 4 and they relate to several blocks and lots containing 39 multiple dwellings in Community District 7 in Councilmember Menchaca's district, all providing rental housing for low-income families. 2017, Council approved a 30-year Article 11 tax exemption pursuant to Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law, which coincided with the 30-year term of the regulatory agreement. <coughs> HPD and the new owner will amend the regulatory agreement to change the restriction period from 30 to 40 years and accordingly HPD is requesting that the tax exemption be extended from 30 to 40 years. Councilmember Menchaca is supportive of these applications. Land use item 233 is an application to modify a project that was previously approved in 2009. At the time, a UDAP designation disposition pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law was approved, property located at 1612 Park Place and 416 Thomas Boylan Street in the Brownsville neighborhood of Brooklyn, Council Member Amprey Samuels District. HPD is now seeking approval to amend the 2009 project summary to allow HPD to place the entire land debt and construction loan in one mortgage secured against the property owned by the Cooperative Corporation. This will benefit the individual co-op owners because upon completion of the construction, the debt will no longer be allocated among the individual cooperative units. The sponsor for this project, Habitat for Humanity, Leighton Thomas Boylan Street Housing Development Corporation is constructing up to three buildings containing approximately 25 cooperative units for sale, affordable to families with annual household incomes between 80% and 130% of AMI. Uh, 
despite the fact that uh, former President Jimmy Carter has not been secured for this project in terms of uh, helping to build or open it, uh, with commitments from HPD to make sh ensure that the tenants will be able to uh, take ownership of this project, uh, Council Member Amprey Samuels is supportive of this application. Land use item 234 is an application for a project site at 21 Arden Street and in the Inwood section of Manhattan and Council Member Rodriguez's district. HPD is seeking approval of an urban development action area project and related actions pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law and approval for a 40-year real property tax exemption pursuant to Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law. This building, which entered city ownership through in rem foreclosure in 1991 and has been participating in the tenant interim lease till program since 2004. It's 12 occupied units and three vacant units. Once rehab work is complete, the building will be conveyed to a cooperative HDFC formed by the building's tenants. Cooperative interest to occupied apartments will be sold to existing tenants for $2,500 per unit, and vacant apartments will be sold for a price affordable to families earning no more than 165% of AMI. Councilmember Rodriguez is supportive of this application. I now call for a vote to approve land use items 221, 222, 226, 227, 228, 229, 233, and 234. Committee Council, please call the roll. Kalos. Aye. Deutsch. Aye. Diaz. Aye. The land use items are approved by a vote of three in the affirmative, no negatives, no abstentions. I will be referred to the full land use committee. Uh, that matter is uh, referred to the uh, full land use committee. We'll now start our public hearings. Uh, first, we'll start with land use items 241, 242, and 243, all related to property at 599 Cortland Avenue in Councilmember Salmanca's district in the Bronx, which we'll hear together. These approvals would facilitate the construction of a new four-story building with approximately eight affordable residential units and commercial space. Land use 241 is an HPD application for the disposition of 599 Cortland Avenue pursuant to section 197C of the New York City Charter, its designation as an urban development action area, and approval of an urban development action area project pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law. Land use item 242 is an application pursuant to section 197C of the New York City Charter where HPD seeks the acquisition of property located at 599 Cortland Avenue, block 2410 and Lot 43 to facilitate the described affordable housing development. Land Use 243 is an HPD application for a new Article 11 tax exemption pursuant to Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law for property located at 599 Cortland Avenue. I now open the public hearing on 599 Cortland Avenue. I would like to invite HPD to uh, present its testimony. If the committee council can please uh, call the names. So I have Ted Weinstein, Genevieve Michael, Erica Baroon. My handwriting's very bad, I'm sorry. <laughs> Wait, what is it, Eric? Benson. Benson, sorry. <laughs> um, Scarlett, I'm not sure the last Rocky. name. Rocky. Naraki. We just went to Rocky. Yeah. And Mario Persita. We can trouble HPD for your testimony. What? Testimony, please. Oh, yeah, no, it's just my testimony. And you guys have the copies of your presentations? Yes. I'll take that. I will now ask committee counsel to administer the oath. Uh, please say your names before answering. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Yeah. Uh, Erica Benson, I do. Genevieve Michael, I do. Ted Weinstein, I You may begin. 
Land use numbers 241, 242, and 243 consists of the proposed ULERP actions for the development of a vacant lot located at 599 Cortland Avenue, Block 2410, Lot 43, in Bronx Council District 17. This lot was previously approved by the City Council on August 12, 2004, Resolution Number 539, for disposition and subsequently conveyed to the selected development team in 2005 for the new construction of a residential building with no more than four units and ground floor commercial space under HPD's new foundations program. However, development of the new building did not progress beyond the initiation of excavation due to structural defects of an abandoned church on the adjacent privately owned lot that made it unsafe to continue with the work. It was ultimately determined that the project would not be feasible until the church could be demolished. According to city records, the neighboring church was demolished during March of 2012. At this time, HPD is prepared to move forward with the development of the site with a new proposal. Given it was previously conveyed by the city to the developer, HPD initiated a ULARP action in order to reacquire ownership of the lot and subsequently dispose of the site. The site will be disposed to a third party entity before conveying the property to the same development team. Land use number 241 relates to the property's designation as an urban development action area, as well as the approval of the project and disposition. Land use number 242 relates to approval for that acquisition of the property in order to facilitate the creation of an affordable housing development. The sponsor for this project is proposing to construct a four-story mixed-use building with eight rental units under HPD's neighborhood construction program. The building will comprise of five studios, two one-bedroom, and one three-bedroom apartments. Targeted household incomes are 60%, 80%, and 100% of AMI. Rents will depend on household size and income range accordingly, $1,183 to $1,496 for a studio, $1,042 to $1,492 for a one-bedroom, and $2,616 for the three-bedroom apartment. The project also includes 753 square feet of commercial space. 599 Cortland Avenue is 100% affordable, and in order to assist with maintaining its affordability, land use number 243 relates to the application of Article 11 tax benefits for a period of 40 years coinciding with the term of the regulatory agreement. The cumulative value of the tax benefits total <laughs> approximately $1,949,933, and the net present value is $513,879. I believe there's a presentation uh, for those who are uh, watching at home. Uh, I, I believe the uh, camera can be modified to make sure that you can see the presentation on the screen behind our speakers. Uh, the presentation will be scanned and available on the City Council website under these items so you can see for yourself. Should I make a presentation? You should. Adjust the microphone so and we make can hear you. Presentation. Thank you. Mario Presida for the development team. Um, <clears throat> as previously mentioned, 599 Cortland, which is located in the Bronx, <clears throat> is intended to be a f three, four, four story uh, mixed use building with ground floor retail uh, and residential units above. It is located on Cortland uh, between 151st Street and 150th Street. And it sits next to a both an occupied building and a vacant lot, which is previously mentioned, uh, housed a church, which was an unsafe building and declared an unsafe building back when we <clears throat> acquired the property at a closing for uh, with HPD. What year was that? This goes back to, I believe, it was mentioned 2005 or somewhere around there. When was the closing? 2005. It was in 2005. Please continue. <clears throat> okay, and it was part of two different programs that we were, this was an add-on to another development that we were working on. Um, the property has is set up to have retail in the front um, and four units above. Uh, we have a site plan here which indicates that um, we are a Presida Development Group, which has been located in the Bronx since the mid 70s. On 173rd between Park and Washington, has formed a um, special purpose entity, Cortland Development Group, to develop the site. 
Uh, we have Concord Management as our managing agent. <clears throat> While we often build many of our own developments, we will be hiring an independent third-party contractor, and Urban Architectural Initiatives is the architect for the project. Um, we've previously discussed the unit mix, but <clears throat> Again, there are five studio apartments, two one-bedrooms, and, and one three-bedroom apartment, <clears throat> and approximately 750 square feet of, of commercial space on the ground floor. Income levels were previously addressed as well. Uh, <clears throat> there is one unit that would be set aside for homeless, and the other units are targeted to, <clears throat> excuse me, either 80% of AMI or 100% of AMI. And that is our presentation. Thank you. Um, there are a number of questions that I tend to ask at every single hearing. Uh, my hope is that more and more can be included in the testimony, so I don't have to ask the questions. Uh, and uh, I, I don't have the benefit of my laptop with my list of 40 or so questions on it, so I'm going to do my best off the top of my head. If there's anything that we fail to ask, we will follow up with questions following the hearing. Uh, what is the total, and, and some of this is information that has previously been shared, uh, but has seemed to have fallen out of this testimony on this specific project, so we'll just try to go as quickly as possible for the purposes of efficiency and time. What is the total project cost? Scarlett? Um, it's around $4 million. For approximately $4 million. What are the hard costs? What are the soft costs? Soft costs are probably approximately a $1 million, and the hard costs are about three. So it's 25% soft costs? J approximately, yes. Who, which construction company will you be using? We have not made a determination. We've put the project out to bid to three separate general contractors. We're still in the process of negotiating and, and reviewing numbers, so we have not determined that yet. Is Proceda a for-profit or non-profit? Proceda is a for-profit entity. We're a third-generation, family-held corporation. <clears throat> we've, as I think I mentioned, we've been at the same location in the Bronx since 1973-4. Uh, we're about to enter the fourth generation. I currently am the sole owner of Proceda Construction Corp., which is sort of the umbrella entity. And then there's, we have a variety of separate purpose entities that own a lot of our real estate. Is Proceda or uh, the uh, construction umbrella MWBEs? Uh, we are not MWBEs. Okay. Uh, what is the uh, makeup of the leadership on the board or of the uh, executive level employees in terms of representation by women? or uh, people of color? Well, we employ approximately 100 people. Probably there's about 30 people on the office management side <clears throat> and uh, about 70 that are out in the field in a variety of management positions or general and skilled and unskilled labor. Uh, we have a... I, I'm just speaking about board members and we, executives, we, so a CEO or a chief operating officer or a chief something like that or an executive. General, general counsel for the company is a woman, okay. not related. Um, I would say that the majority of the man, management is male, although our compliance, our compliance officer and general counsel are female. So it sounds like 2% of, sorry, so okay, and that, that's not a fair statement. So what is the, the management side? How many at managers a, at would you are, say there are? If there are five senior officers, okay. two are women and three are men. Okay. So that, that is better. That is, that is 40%. So thank you for the correction. We're just here trying to get it out on the record. Uh, with regards to the construction companies that you've put out to bid, uh, are any of them MWBEs? Do you have any MWBE targets that you're seeking to meet? Uh, I do not know if I, any of the firms are MWBEs. We have not yet established targets for the project, and normally 
We are used to working with an MWBE requirement. <clears throat> Our compliance department has direct oversight of the MWBE requirements for the project, and normally we establish those in conjunction with HPD. HPD, is there an MWBE requirement on this project? Yes. What is the MWBE requirement on this project? It's our standard requirement. I can get back to you with the details, though. Uh, at the next hearing and moving forward, I'm expecting the exact number, please. Got it. Uh, or if it could just be in the testimony, that would be preferable. That it's, it's fine. We'll, we'll keep going. All of this is stuff that we ask every time. We'd love to just see in the testimony. Uh, with regards to uh, the people who are going to be doing work on your site building this four-story building, uh, will they receive pay that is commensurate with the same work that other folks are doing in the metropolitan region? If they get hurt on the job, will they have health insurance so that they can go to a doctor? If, God forbid, they can't return to work, will they have disability insurance? Uh, will they receive uh, on-the-job training and certificates, and will they, if they, it sounds like this is a very long-standing family business, if they spend their life working for you, will they have a pension to retire on? And this goes for both the construction workers, the people who maintain and service your building, and anyone working in your retail. Okay, first of all, <clears throat> we have, we have insurance requirements for all of our subcontractors. <clears throat> and we will also have insurance requirements for the GC, which we would expect to pass down. He, we would expect that the general contractor in this instance, presuming it's not us, would also be passing down the same insurance requirements. The requirements typically include workman's comp coverage for their employees. So if, if an employee were to get hurt or a worker were to be hurt on site, they would normally make a workman's comp claim under the comp, workman's comp policy, and that would cover um, an employee. We do not require typically a disability policy that either our subcontractors maintain or that a GC would maintain. Um, so, do you, is there? Do you believe there's a qualitative difference between a worker's the amount a employee could recover under a uh, workers' comp claim versus under health insurance and disability insurance? Well, I don't think health insurance <clears throat> necessarily relates to a comp claim. We maintain health insurance. We, we have health insurance for our employees. Um, it is a participatory plan. We cover 50%. The employee covers 50%. We have a 401k, not a pension plan for our employees. We match at a 25% rate currently, although we adjust that on an annual basis. Um, it, these are things that make me happy to hear. So this is for your direct employees, but what about for folks under your construction company as well as if you decide not to build it yourself, anyone that you would contract with? Okay, so <coughs> our... Your values are clearly in the right place. Our employees are all technically either employed by Proceda Construction Corp or payrolled by Proceda Construction Corp. So all of our employees are covered under our general benefits policy, which includes health, de medical, dental, and then 401k, which you qualify for, I think, after three months of employment. Uh, that covers our our. Our that, that's people. the carpenter who shows up and builds the building frame, the iron worker who does any rebar. No, that is Presida Construction Corp's employee. And do okay. they have those same so benefits? Our, our carpenter who might be on our payroll yep. is covered by our benefits. But the subcontractor may or may is only covered by the benefits that are part of that subcontractor's insurance and, and requirements or plan. We, we, is it, would you say that you think that giving this health insurance and, and 401k and what have you is, is a good thing, that that is why you do it with your employees? Uh, we find it to be, we believe it's a good thing, yes. Would you 
also say that if you think it is good for the goose, that it is also good for the gander and that this should be applied to subcontractors too, that those values should flow through on all of your projects? We would like for it to flow through. However, <clears throat> we do not control the business practices of our subs. So what we're finding, and this is a, is a global issue, insurance limits are difficult um, because many of the smaller subs cannot afford the premiums that they have to pay or that they're required to pay for limits. Um, some of them do provide benefits, but we frankly have not really drilled down on a, any particular subcontractor's <clears throat> benefits plans. What we do look at, though, is we make sure that our subs are submitting payrolls, that their employees are legal, that they're, being, that they're able to be paid by payroll as opposed to getting cash off the books. So to, to be clear, everyone is legal. There, no one, no one is illegal. Uh, I, I guess just to, to just not go down that road any further, but just, uh, are you familiar with any type of agreement that a subcontractor could sign if they weren't in a place to offer health insurance or weren't in a place to offer training, where they could work with a, a collective of employees maybe uh, and uh, instead of the employer necessarily having to uh, set up all the funds themselves they could do a, a an example would be they could do a payroll deduction and they could say okay this person makes uh, this carpenter is going to get paid uh, $40 an hour and for every hour they work they're also gonna deduct uh, $4 for health insurance $2 for pension and, and things like that. Are you familiar with any type of structure or agreement somebody could sign to create such a structure? Well, <clears throat> that structure is available for, it, it's certainly available to any business that's out there, okay? Um, in certain instances where we are responsible for monitoring wage payments, such as on prevailing wage jobs, mm -hmm. our compliance department works actively to make sure that if people have benefit plans that are not union trades, they get incorporated, those benefit plans are properly accounted for. Um, we provide guidance to some of our smaller subcontractors as to what opportunities are out there for payrolling and things of that nature. And often it depends upon the level of sophistication of the sub or of the, the business as to what they're able to employ. Uh, we've done a fair amount of overseeing of payroll for people to make sure that their payrolls get met. Um, so we're, I, I think we are active in that area. What would it take? It, so it sounds like you're, you're, I believe that paying people a, a wage that is commensurate, giving them health benefits, retirement benefits, and I think we both agree. I think the disagreement may be just making sure that subcontractors abide by that. It sounds like in certain cases you're required by law to have a prevailing wage. What would it take for in this case, and I know it's still a small project, but as HPD will tell you, I think that this should be happening on every single project in the city. I get a list every single month of the number of people injured on the job. Uh, it's it's, it's staggering and, and people are dying in construction every day. So I'm just looking at things we can do to keep people safe uh, as we're building the affordable housing we need. Uh, so I guess what would it take from, from HPD or what have you so that you, you could pay people a commensurate rate with health benefits and whether it's through uh, Proceda Construction or through the A subcontractor? It's... <clears throat> I'm not sure I necessarily have the, the specific answer to it. Certainly, we don't control the business practices of our, of the businesses that, that work for us, where we- but, but you can when it's a term of your contract because there's a prevailing wage requirement. When, yes, to a certain extent, we can control, we can ensure, and we do ensure that workers are paid the prevailing wage, 
okay? But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're overseeing just because the, the if the carpenter, for argument's sake, is supposed to be paid $80 an hour with mm -hmm. fringe, we can verify that the $80 gets paid, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the employer has a plan in place that has medical benefits for those employees and it's getting applied to against the, the wage. I, I was an ERISA attorney, so I'm very familiar with dealing with uh, the specifics of ensuring that the benefits are paid, but in the narrow situation, we may have lost everyone watching at home, but in the narrow situation where an employer is paying an employee just their payroll but not paying for their benefits, that employer will have signed an agreement often called a collective bargaining agreement and a developer such as yourself might have signed something called a uh, project labor agreement uh, upon which litigation could be brought in the federal court to recover any funds unpaid and part of those collective bargaining agreements and project labor agreements and prevailing wage requirements allows for auditing by both you as a developer, the city and its controller, as well as uh, an organization representing those employees. Um, uh, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. No, you, well, I think you're correct. However, this particular project is not, is not there, there's not a requirement to pay prevailing wage. It's not subject to a PLA. And while we believe, while Proceda believes it maintains a, a strong relationship with the building trades, mm -hmm. we're, we're not signatory to any trade agreements. And, so, and, and I, I, I can't push you one way or another in terms of who to work with, and I don't want that to be construed. I'm just an advocate for paying people well and having benefits and being able to retire. Uh, in terms of the building service workers, do you contract that out or do you do that within Prusita? Uh At the moment, we are planning. We currently contract it out. We have third-party providers for our building management. Uh, we expect to contract this out. Uh, my guess is right now we've identified Concord as a potential management company. Uh, this building is, given the eight units, it, it's a small building. It will not have a full-time super. Uh, it'll be, you know, showing up and, and doing whatever cleanup and, and trash removal is necessary. Do you know if Concord is a, a firm that follows similar values to yourself in terms of paying people the, the rate of the neighbor of, of the area and health insurance and 401k and whatnot um i i believe they have the values whether they're signatory to 32 bj or not i don't know i assume they're not 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 asking for 32 and, bj in particular and I, just but i do think sure they're the benefits workers. are there i i we could get back to you on that but i i don't know that that is helpful in terms of how much you expect to pay the folks one way i phrase the question is uh, the mayor is pretty famous for saying the best way we can get out of the affordable housing crisis is to pay people more. That's one of the reasons we waged, raised the wage to $15 an hour. Uh, that being said, uh, your rates are 80% of AMI, which is, so you have between 60 and 100% of AMI. Uh, will you be paying, and will everyone on the project, you, even the folks who may come in through a sub, be making at least between forty-three thousand and one hundred twelve thousand dollars a year, and be able to afford to live in the affordable housing uh, they are building. That being said, the preferred answer is no. They won't qualify because we're paying them much more. Uh, as again, I am not at the moment uh, until we hire a contracting firm to do the work i cannot i don't have the answer to that question would you the be minimum willing to wage commit to saying that the folks who are building the affordable housing should at least be able to l afford to live in the affordable housing because these are at 60 percent of ami 15 dollars an hour does not hit forty three thousand dollars eight forty three thousand eight hundred and sixty dollars hadn't thought about it from that perspective but I did the math and I, I see that you're correct I mean I can tell you that people that work for us all can afford to quite let me rephrase that 
our employees mm -hmm. earn enough to many of them earn enough not to qualify to live that, here. That, that is fair. Uh, another question that, uh, folks, uh, I, I, I like to ask is just, do you have a local hire commitment on this project? Um, I don't know if the for this project we have a local hiring HPD, commitment. HPD, is there a local hire requirement on this project? Yes, we have the higher NYC requirement. Um, we can get back to you on the specifics with that. Okay. Uh, philosophically, I can tell you that I believe we're better suited when we hire subs. And again, I can't speak for the GC, but it works to our advantage to hire trades that are from the borough in which we are working because their workers tend to be situated closer to the site. We have a preponderance of employees that live throughout at least four of the five boroughs. We don't have much work in Staten Island. We have much work in the other four boroughs, and we have people that live in, in each of the four boroughs. So HPD has indicated that there is a, a local hire requirement through Hire NYC. If somebody is watching at home and lives in the vicinity of 599 Cortland Avenue, and they are interested in working to build this four-story building, which is pictured here is only three-story? One of the floors is set back. Okay. So it wouldn't be viewed. Fair enough. In the uh, if somebody's interested in working on this job site and building a four-story building, perhaps across the street from them or in their local neighborhood, uh, where should they go to apply and who can they call? Um, well, they, they can go to the Hire NYC site. They can also go to our website, which is www.procedacompanies.com, or they can click on the info and click on the info button, or they can just send an email to info at Proceda Companies and put a uh, new hire in the subject line. Great, and uh, if somebody is doing so, please feel free to copy bkalos at uh, council.nyc.gov, and we'd love to make sure that your process is smooth and easy. My concern is by directing people just to hire at NYC, they might get sent to another borough versus being able to know what they're applying for, who they're interested in working for, and being able to gain that employment. So that is uh, helpful. Uh, you're receiving tax abatements uh, that HPD has testified to, uh, what is the per unit subsidy that you're expecting on this project? Uh, HPD can feel free to jump in on what you believe, what the term sheets subsidy maximum is. So I think the city subsidy estimate is 190,000. Um, I think as we said before, generally on these sorts of projects, we limit at, or we try to aim to 125,000 per unit. But I think in cases, particularly on small projects like that, it's hard to actually do that and get these projects done. And so we often will go above that if it is absolutely necessary. Uh, back to Proceda. So it looks like HPD is looking at 125,000 in subsidies. That's their target. How much more would their target need to go up if you were to come back and say, we want to require that our subs are, are paying more and have health benefits and uh, retirement benefits? Sorry, just to correct, we're estimating on this project 190,000, not 125. We're going above what our target is because this is a small project that is hard for us to be able to finance and put together. Aha. And what is the term sheet's maximum? So my understanding on this term sheet is it's not a maximum. It is actually just an aim, um, and it is 125. So we are going above term sheet here. So I just learned that there's apparently no limit. There's just a target of which uh, they are going 50% over. Uh, how much further over would it need to go? For the, the only way I know how to mandate anything in terms of wages is through a prevailing wage model. Uh, our experience is that prevailing wages add at least 30 to 35 percent to the cost 
of a project. Um, so I would say it is a there's a significant premium. We're we're having difficulties with a third party GC, and one of the reasons we're we've elected not to build this is because I, I just think our our cost model is is too high. But um, you know, I'm not sure that it would really. I I don't know if it's a cost issue, and the reason I say that is what we struggle with oftentimes. <clears throat> from a practical standpoint, is we have trades out there. We have many trades that will work prevailing wage, and we have many trades that don't want any part of working prevailing wage because they either can't handle the payroll or because they lose workers if they're working on mixed, um, a variety of non and, and prevailing wage projects. They will lose workers if they try that have moved from a prevailing wage job to a non-prevailing wage job, they find they lose employees or they lose productivity. So given the fact that we're looking at small vendors here and small general contractors, I I'm not sure that the prevailing wage model would necessarily work, but I would tell you that the premium is at least 30 percent to get to a prevailing wage model. If there is a organization that represents employees or workers that is saying no to work, please feel free to make sure you connect them with me because uh, I, I would be interested in understanding. I, I have never seen an organization representing workers who, who have said no to work, uh, provided it was within the terms of the area standards for how much their employees make. I I'm not sure by or I didn't say organization. I said subcontract. There are contracts. Got it. Okay. Not organizations. Okay. So those were the the standard questions. Uh, sorry. Are there any other subsidies coming in? Are you getting any money from the state? Are you getting any money from HDC? Are you getting any other subsidies beyond the Article 11 and the term sheet, hundred ninety thousand dollars per unit? That is. Litec. Anything else? We're not getting Litec. So no federal, no state, no. any financing no. from HDC? No. Any existing debt on the project? Um, not that's not going to be retired at construction loan closing. We have a small $200,000 <coughs> pre-dev loan out there that will be retired as part of the construction at the construction loan closing. So there will be no other debt on the project. Was the 200000 from the city or... Which entity was the 200000 It was not from the city. Uh, how are you retiring? What, what structure are you using to retire the... So it's private debt? It's private debt. We also, by the way, will have approximately... We'll have at least $500,000 of our own cash in the deal, which is generating little to no return. Okay, sorry. Just to follow up. So I'm familiar with HPD retiring debts at... Closing, what mechanism did you use to retire the $200,000 in debt? We haven't used any mechanism yet to retire. It'll be part of the construction financing or, ret or retired with equity. The debt is going to be... Is the debt from a uh, related uh, Proceda organization or is it a bank or who... who it's, it's from a bank. It's from uh, the housing partnership. Okay. So it's housing partnership, which is specializes in this, and so they're they're eating all of it, or they're taking a piece out of the project that hopefully will be built. No, it's actually getting repaid. So the sources, the the so construction the sources for financing are equity yeah. debt from who's, who's who was the no, New York City housing partnership. No, who's debt for oh, construction? Either. Either from the low income fund or from um, CPC is going to do the construction financing. Okay. And then there's the HPD subsidy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then you're doing half a million dollars in owner equity out of the $4 million project? Yes. Okay. Back to HPD. For, so those were the standard questions. If you come back here again, please, please expect it. Uh, this building. Sorry, there was a couple new ones we've added. Uh, the building will be ADA accessible.
because it is it, new construction? It's ADA. It complies with ADA guidelines, yes. Will it have an elevator? No, there's no elevator in the building. Not so enough. The first floor is retail. And a unit in the back. So that will be an ADA unit? Yes. And then the rest of the building will not be ADA accessible? Correct. Okay. There's uh, simply no room for an elevator to, to put the elevator in. Is that a issue with zoning code? Uh, in turn, are you building this building? Is is this building maximum build out? Uh, yes. And, and it's as of right. And so, so as of right, you you would if you put an elevator in, would it count against your floor area? Yes. Okay. Uh, if it didn't count against it, are there additional restrictions on the building form that are stopping you from putting an elevator in? You know, again, it was a cost consideration. How much is an elevator in this building? Uh, it's sixty, seventy thousand, eight, maybe eighty thousand dollars, and it also would have significant impact on the floor plan. Would you be willing, uh, just in, in the interest of, of good faith to share just what considerations you would need to see changed? Just Let's just say you're talking to a council member who's on the planning committee and has oversight over planning in the city and was interested in building new ADA moving forward so that all this affordable housing that we're spending $4 million on will, will actually, if the people who move in age in place, which I hope they do and they stay there for their entire lives, it's all of us in our future have a disability coming. Uh, there are very few yes, of us that are, that, are, that, are, that are George Burns and smoke a cigar every day and are fine till the day we die. So it, it is one of those uh, questions of just what, would you, what magic wand would I need to wave so that you can add that elevator in? in, in the, what kind of a zoning district is this? What's the zoning? Uh, I don't have that offhand. If I had my laptop, I would look it up on Zola. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll pull that, but would you be willing to share what would need to be relaxed in order for you to add an elevator? Purely academic. I, I mean, well, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's money and sort of floor plan. Presumably, you could deal with the floor plan, right? And it may change the unit distribution, but <clears throat> there is definitely a cost impact both on the hard cost and then sort of revisiting the floor the the architecture as it currently exists it, it seems like at one hundred ninety thousand dollars per unit it is it is a five percent cost increase to make this building accessible if the zoning were could accommodate it so um, could could HPD uh, come back and answer whether or not doing, uh, you're doing 1.6 million, approximately 1.6 million dollars in subsidies uh, for these eight units. Uh, would HPD come back and just, if it's in R6 with a 2-4 overlay, uh, which has, do we know what the FAR on an R6 off the top of our head is? So, yeah. we're built full. So it's, it's fully built out. So yes, would HPD come back to us and uh, at a future date, uh, perhaps related to this project, on just on a 1.6 million dollar outlay, whether or not, why, whether or not it feels that 60 to 70 thousand dollars that is worth 60 to 70 thousand dollars to make every single unit accessible moving forward? Uh, I don't think it's something that we can think about at this project at this stage in the game, but it's certainly something we can keep in mind moving forward. Okay, we'll we'll keep this conversation ongoing on every single project that we hear. The next piece is uh, something that we've uh, brought up on a number of occasions, which is just uh, actually what was the value of the lost taxes? So this has had a tax abatement since 2004, I believe. Is that correct? No, we're paying taxes on the land. Oh, uh, that is good to know. Not uh, really. <laughs> <laughs> so. This was transferred to you from HPD in 2004 or 2005, you closed in 05? There were two programs at the time. We had been designated to build, uh, to do development under, 
I, I, it was a two-family home development, and I don't remember what the program was at in 2004 5. This was in a lot that was, I don't want to say hanging out, but it was, a, it was a lot that was in the new foundations program. We were building in the area, and we were asked, would you guys, can, can we put this into your award? And you developed the site. And we said, okay. When we, so we closed on financing for both this, we closed on our financing <clears throat> and closed on the land. We closed on this site as part of the whole package. Um, we had a third party contractor building this site. When excavation started, the property that was immediately adjacent to it, it was a, an old one story church. They noticed when they dug pits next to um, the building that they could see into the basement or the crawl space. I don't remember. It's been a while. We called the building department. Building department put a UB on the building. We stopped work. UB? An unsafe building. On the on adjacent the church, building. on the adjacent building. We stopped work. <laughs> we finished the development we were working on. Nothing happened with the church. We were stuck. We ended up paying back Chase, who was our construction lender, so we had the land free and clear. It was still in the it was still in Cortland Development Group, which was the I believe the entity that we took title under. And we've been paying taxes and trying to work through a solution. Finally it took a while to get this church the church demolished. The church was eventually demolished by the city. There was a tax, I think there was a lien on the property. The property was sold um, privately. It's privately owned, currently privately owned. And the presentation um, materials, hold on. Okay, this is helpful. Continue. That's where we sit. When, when was the church demolished? I, I don't recall. 2012. Do you mind uh, saying it into the 2012. mic? 2012. And the other property with which this property was uh, conveyed, did that, is that an affordable housing project? The other property is a series of maybe 15 or 20 two-family houses, two or three-family houses that are, they, are not contiguous to this particular parcel. Are they affordable housing or are they market rate or what was the? They were sold under the, um, I forget which program it was, but it was an affordable, it was an affordable housing development. I believe somebody has an answer that they can share on the record. Well, new foundations program. Okay, so it was affordable housing. Yes. And did those properties receive an article 11 at the time? No, I don't think so. Odd, odd question. So, what has changed since '04 till today that built, you were able to build affordable housing in '04 without an Article 11, and you haven't come back for an Article 11 on those properties? Why an Article 11 now versus then? Well, first of all, they were all subject to a tax abatement for in the, under the new foundations program. So we saw those were, those homes were built and sold to individual purchasers. I believe that there was a there was some form of tax abatement in place for that program. Whether that tax abatement period is lapsed or not, I don't know because I forget the principle. And so when it was transferred to you, those properties had a tax abatement. When this property was transferred to you, it did not also have a tax the it, same new foundations tax abatement? Can't answer that question. Don't know the answer to the question. You see what I'm getting at? Sort of. I, I so I, I, you're, you're saying that you've been paying taxes on this property. What I'm not clear about is generally HPD has been here and just said if we're transferring properties, we must give the Article 11 with that property. So I'm just trying to get to the bottom of either 
we don't need to continue to give people tax abatements when we transfer, or we did and there's something special about your case? We didn't build anything here. The only way to make this deal, the transaction, work mm -hmm. <clears throat> and to keep the have the economics work is to get the tax abatement that in order that's will it, helps will HPD an get an effort. get us an answer on what the taxes are on this property and if it was transferred with or without a abatement back in 2004 yeah we can get that thank you uh, the the next piece is in in I February, we had a project in the Bronx in Councilmember Ayala's district that had a, a vacant area next to it. Uh, and at that time, I asked HPD to work on bringing when the, what I said to HPD, which I will, and, and I've said many times since then, is I don't want to see affordable housing projects showing up that are going into vacant lots adjacent to other vacant lots. So I guess the first question is, with regard to the tax lien on the adjacent site, why was that, to HPD, why was that transferred to a private owner when it could have been transferred and made merged into a larger site with the existing project? Um, I want to confirm the details on whether or not there was a tax lien because I don't think that's in the information that I've had to date and want to make sure that, you know, we are having a full conversation about that. My understanding about that lot is that there is a private owner who has asked either too high of a price because he's not interested in selling or just too high of a price because that's how much money he wants or some combination, and it has not been a property that the city has been able to acquire for a reasonable price. At a previous hearing. Oh, yes. I, I, a, I think you're correct. And secondly, I have had this, we have had discussions actually about partnering up with the lot owner before it was, it's currently owned by the, by the property owner that is adjacent to the vacant lot. Okay. So that's who currently owns the property. Well, there's two g vacant lots. So the person who owns vacant lot 47 now owns vacant lot 44, or is it lot 4848, which is the clinic? The, the clinic owns the vacant lot in question. Yes. The clinic owns the vacant lot in question. So they so they own two vacant lots addition, uh, adjacent to their property. Yeah, one of its parking lot, I believe, right? Yeah, the New York Psychotherapy Institute. The New York Psychotherapy Institute on the corner. Okay, 150th so. 150th owns both vacant parcels. And so uh, upon your recollection, they picked up lot 44 through tax lien sale. HPD wants to double check that. Yes. Okay. Uh, at a previous hearing, something I shared is that um, the constitutional uh, power for eminent domain is very strong. It is strong enough to, to level a neighborhood in Brooklyn to build a stadium on it uh, based on the definition of blight. Uh, I did not necessarily agree with what happened, the results there, but the, the Supreme Court uh, affirmed a lot of those powers. In this case, we literally have a vacant lot, which has been there for uh, at this point, six years in a building that was unsafe since 2005, uh, will, I, I've asked before, will HPD uh, start using, if a, if a landlord is not willing to come to the table under eminent domain, they are entitled to uh, fair compensation. We just don't take it from them. But if they're asking in excess of market, would HPD commit to going to those landlords and either offering to do affordable housing with them or telling them we're taking that property from them because it is a blight and that is literally the definition for what it should be used for, which is a vacant lot that's been sitting there for a decade. I think HPD you know, currently uses eminent domain when we think it's necessary. I think on this project, we thought it was best to move forward with the project that we have here and didn't necessarily think that eminent domain was appropriate. And I, I assume that will continue to be our position moving forward. 
that it is not appropriate or you're going to evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis? Evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, so you, you are comfortable affirming that you did consider eminent domain on this? I can't confirm whether or not we considered it on this case in particular, but I think I, you know, I, I certainly can say that I think we felt comfortable moving forward with this project and didn't think it was necessary. Yeah. Um, and again, that I think it was, you know, I think one if of the you things- You get back to us and the, sorry to, to interrupt you, if, if you could just get back to us with like, HPD did or didn't, and then just a, a value statement on whether or not it will start happening moving forward. I'm not sure that I will be able to determine whether or not HPD did or didn't evaluate something. Obviously, as you can see, this is a project with quite a bit of history, and there's been a quite a bit of turnover in the agency, so I don't want to commit to doing something that I'm not sure I can actually do. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that I think is difficult about projects like these, as you're seeing, is we both are getting stalled on projects moving forward, and we are trying to figure out how to unlock things that haven't happened. And so I think it's always a balance between trying to figure out how we can move the ball forward without getting wrapped up in trying to add uh, additional burdens. Just, just as a heads up, like, I would really love to work with HPD on evaluating eminent domain, and uh, I, I'm working on legislation to this point. We're always happy to have a conversation. Fair, fair, fair enough. Uh, it's actually going to be really cool. <laughs> uh, one of the questions I'd like to ask about is so, um, in in at Cortland Avenue and and. East 151st Street, I, I don't have my computer. I'd usually hop on Street Easy to find out what the going rate for apartments are. What is the going rate for housing in the area at market rate? Do you have that? And what, yeah. What is market rate in this part of the city? She has the the list of comps. I mean, I think the comps that I'm looking at here look like. Oh, um, a three bedroom, you know, roughly in the. Or some three bedroom, some two bedroom, roughly in the $2,000 range. We only have one bedrooms and studios in this building. Uh, the one bedrooms I have here are at $1,800, $1,675, and at the studios at $1,599. That's the market rate comps? Yeah, those were comps that both HPD and Proceda um, collaborated on. Okay, so uh, in this case, your your targets are actually below that. So, good, thank you. Uh, and uh, do you know what the AMIs in the surrounding neighborhood are, or from the census data? So the first check is: Are your units going to have a gentrifying effect on the neighborhood? And it appears that your rates are below what the market is in the neighborhood, which means you, you won't be having a gentrifying effect, which is something that makes me happy. Then the next question becomes, what are the AMIs? Because sometimes market rate units will be more expensive than what the people in the area earn. I believe on the last page of the handout, the AMIs at 80% of uh, median are for a, let's call it a one-bedroom household, which would be a household size of two people, 67,000. So that, based on your research in the area, people are, so the question is, so if, if we looked at the building on the corner, which is a mixed-use building, the people who live in those units who may be rent-regulated or rent-controlled, are they at 80 or 108 percent of AMI, or are they lower? I don't believe I have that information. Okay. Uh, Moving forward, and I think this is something I've mentioned to HPD. Uh, this may be the first time I've asked that this succinctly in a hearing. Uh, just if you can pull the census track information, the census will report on incomes based on the census tract. Uh, do you happen to have that information here? 
No, but we'll get it for you moving forward. Thank you. Uh, what is the land value? What's the land value in the budget? Uh, what we have here is 390000 Can you elaborate on the one bedroom unit set aside for homeless? I want to thank uh, the land use chair, Rafael Salamanca. He's been pretty dedicated to having a 10% homeless set aside in a building of eight units. Uh, that is quite impressive because this exceeds the 10%. It's probably closer to 15%. Uh, so just which AMI tier will it come from? Will you use a tenant or project-based voucher to fill the unit? And how will this placement process work? Um, so it's coming from the 57% tier, and I think <laughs> we certainly also appreciate uh, Chair Salamanca's advocacy here. It is difficult for us to figure out um, how to get these types of units in an eight-unit building, so we tried to be creative in trying to think about it. Um, it will be a tenant-based voucher. Um, HPD has a homeless placement services unit that will uh, recommend three I think likely families who go through that process um, to whoever is leasing up and you know taking care of uh, getting people in the units and it will move from there. If that family for some reason moves out, then the replacement will also go through the HPD homeless placement services process. Speaking of placements, if I am watching at home and I live in the vicinity of 599 Cortland Avenue and I am interested in getting one of these eight, sorry, seven units uh, because one of them is set aside, uh, where do I go to apply? We will be posting signage at the appropriate time on the sidewalk shed and at the project site as well as probably on our website that will give a mailing address or an email address for application to the, um, to the lottery that will be conducted for the marketing for this development. I hear there's a website out there where a lot of ho affordable housing projects exist. Uh, will people be able to apply through that, or do they have to go directly through you? No, they will apply. They will go ultimately through that website. The New York City Housing Connect. So, uh, uh, perfect. So, anyone who's watching at home, if you're interested in applying for this project or any others, please visit Housing Connect. Uh, you can Google it. Uh, is there a vanity URL yet of like Housing Connect at NYC? I'm actually not sure, and I should be, so I will find out. <laughs> Let's get a yeah. URL pretty please, um, because otherwise the uh, web addresses that the city has are pretty hard. Uh, I'm guessing they could go to like hpd.nyc.gov or? Yeah, I'm sure on hpd.nyc.gov you could find it. Um, but again, that's not a great answer to that question, so we'll work on that. There, there's some uh, follow-up. Uh, which we hope to hear back from you on. I want to thank everyone for their honesty and transparency and engagement. And uh, thank you for your uh, partnership. Uh, the more that can be in the uh, testimony, the, the fewer questions that I have to ask. Uh, but I just want to thank you. I want to thank our committee staff, committee uh, council, and members for being here. Is there anyone here from the public to testify? Uh, Seeing none, uh, I will now close the public hearing on land use items 241, 242, and 243, and the application will be laid over. This concludes today's hearing. I'd like to thank everyone, and uh, this meeting is hereby adjourned. <laughs>